So I want to start this topic uh, with a small story on the Chinese rope experiment. So for those of you uh, who haven't heard about this experiment, let me give you um, a short story on this. So uh, it seems that there's a there's a philosopher called Searle who did a thought pro thought experiment like uh, there's a person inside a room and uh, um, you know some and that person doesn't know to read or write Chinese and then somebody from the outside of the room they given uh, a piece of text in Chinese language and uh, this person's job is just to see the shape and the symbols in the Chinese language get the information uh, from what's available within the room uh, and all the information will be available in the room. And this person's job is to just find the text that's matching for uh, according to the input that they received, and then finally give the corresponding output for that input text to the output window. So the person on the other end understands or assumes that the person inside the room understands Chinese, whereas in reality, the person is just uh, identifying and matching shapes, and it's uh, and is processing the output, uh, whereas that person doesn't have to understand Chinese at all. So this is the Chinese uh, room experiment. And uh, the whole AI, uh, in my opinion, is kind of very similar. Uh, with that being said, I've, uh, like I said uh, before, I'm Siddharth Telangovanan. I'm currently a senior technical product manager at Amazon. And uh, before going into the presentation, I want to give you a disclaimer that all the opinions here are, are my own and doesn't reflect any of the current or previous organizations that I'm, I'm, I am and I was part of. A little bit of uh, background about me. I come from India um, and the southern part of India, Chennai. I did my undergrad in College of Engineering in India and did my postgrad in MBA in Arizona State University. Uh, I love photography and I love motorcycle riding and I also love drawing and computer design. As you can see, that's the Lamborghini I drew uh, using AutoCAD. So uh, a very creative person, uh, which is why I really love doing product management. I'm passionate about this space. The next thing, my journey to uh, product management so far. So I'm basically a very creative person and uh, I'm also very empathetic. Uh, like. I identify myself as uh, an INFJ, the introverted, intuitive feeling and judging personality. So these are my core uh, traits. And because of this, I really loved um, working on designs of uh, software products. And I started off with mobile applications, which made me start on like designing delightful customer experience. Um, so I, I was doing this back in 2014 uh, for a mobile application startup back home in India. Um, and eventually I slowly graduated to um, translating user stories to product features. Um, I really enjoyed solving a uh, customer's problem in that way and like, you know, uh, translating all the, all the customer requirements, the features into uh, clear documentation and then handing, over, handing them over to the engineers. Um, really loved working collaborative with the designers and engineers. Um, now, as I moved to my next role, uh, I took on bigger scope uh, within the product management where I'm now not only um, writing requirements or the specifications for the product or feature, but I'm also now solving problems. Like, you know, what, what could be the best solution to solve a particular problem? So. Um, I was doing this for quite a while before my MBA, before I came to the US. Um, and uh, I really loved working with uh, multi, uh, multiple product managers uh, where uh, we basically brainstorm and discuss how to best design a particular feature. Uh, given there are multiple teams, multiple product teams, multiple designer, engineer teams, etc. So I was doing that for quite a while. And then now here at Amazon, my scope is much larger in terms of uh, um, as a senior product manager here, where I not only like solve problems, but also um, discover problems, define what the problem is, and then more importantly, prioritize what problems to solve. Because there are a whole bunch of problems that you can go out there and solve, but where you add value is like prioritize the problem that you want to solve now and what, can, what you want to solve later on. So that's a pretty much uh, a snapshot of 
how uh, I started my product manager journey um, almost like 10 years back and where I am right now. And uh, it also speaks about the why uh, I'm doing this, which, uh, you, which will form a large part of a presentation today, which you will know in, in some time. So today's agenda, today uh, we'll be covering three key topics. The first one is the product manager's value proposition and product management, and then the AI value proposition and product management, and then finally, the product manager powered by artificial intelligence value proposition and product management. So let's get started. What is the product manager's value proposition today? And if you see, I've tried to uh, summarize uh, conceptually, how the PM ladder looks like. Um, you know, someone might start as an associate pro product manager. They then grow to be a product manager, and then some companies have the senior product manager, and then you have, uh, and you, and then you grow to become a product leader. A product leader can be a director, uh, a general manager, uh, uh, a vice president, or a chief product officer. Any anything that uh, requires you to lead a group of teams or on organizations, um, uh, I defined it under this bucket. So um, if you start from the left to right, you have the associate product manager who does, um, you know, who translates user stories to customer experience and product features, which is, you know, if you recollect my product journey map, I was doing as the initial stage. And then as one grows uh, in their PM skill and role, they start taking on more responsibility in terms of, uh, uh, writing user stories and coming up with new features of how they can fit into an existing product or how they can launch a new product to meet a specific demand. And um, and and once you once you do product management for a while, now you take on uh, now you become a, a much more senior product manager in the space, and then you take on uh, more experience, more responsibilities in your workplace, and uh, where you just now where you just don't solve um existing customer problems but also identify um you know uh, new product new problems and products and then you also work on product strategy uh, so now having done all these things for a while people grow to become uh the leader in the product space and in organizations where they not only take care of they are not only managed products but they also manage people so uh, a typical product leader um, identifies problem where the problems is not even identified yet. They are required to have a, a three to five year strategy or a conviction on what's the next biggest thing that's going to happen where the company can monetize on that. And then they also have to manage a portfolio of products and people and cross organizational teams. Now, if you see one pattern in this whole uh, map, you see that there's a lot of clarity in the left side of the ladder um, where most of the things that you get to work on are already preset and predetermined and predefined. So you just come in uh, as, a, as an associate product manager or a product manager and execute. So you need to have really good execution jobs and then um, you keep delivering results. Now, as you move al 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 along the ladder, you take on more ambiguity. That's why you see the far end of the product leadership is all about ambiguity and nothing is clear over there. And as part of your job, you are required to uh, drive clarity from that ambiguity. So leaders, most of the times they get uh, involved with um, the strategy definitions, uh, the three-year planning, the architectural planning, uh, identifying problems, prioritizing problems, um, and all those things where it is like completely ambiguous. There are there are there may be thousand things that you can go and do, but you need to be laser focused on what you want to do and how you want to prioritize, for, which is best for the company. So let's take that map and apply it. Uh, in my product management journey so far, and I'll help. I'll uh, break down the different elements involved in the journey so far. So, if you look at 
uh, who I am basically. I'm I'm a very creative person. I'm an empath. I like uh, I mean I, I I'm really good at empathizing with people, their emotions, their feelings, why they are doing certain things. Um, you know, what are they here for? What are their goals, etc. So this has basically helped me to understand the customer from uh, what are their needs, what are their cultural needs, what what are their emotional needs, etc. So these are my core human traits, creativity and empathy. And now if you look at the functional attributes of the product manager, you uh, typically get to design customer experiences or user experiences. You have to write user stories. You have to translate the user stories to product specifications. Um, a product manager typically solves problem. And then, like I said, the more senior they become, the more they work on strategy and problem discovery, uh, problem definition, and then prioritizing what problems to solve first. Now, these are functional attributes of a product manager. Now, if, if you're a product manager, if you have been in the product management space for a while, you may have come across terms like, you know, functional requirements and the non-functional requirements of a specification. So this is more on that terms where functional attributes are what are your core part of the job? Like, what are you paid for you to do? And then there are other non-functional attributes of a PM, which means that there are some of your personal uh, individualistic uh, skills that you bring to the table, which is not directly related to how your product behaves, but how you execute, how you work with others, and how you, how do you interact with your organization. And those I define as the non-functional attributes of a product manager. So some of the at non-functional attributes of the product management managers here are accountability, interpretability, ethics, leadership, and influencing stakeholders. So by accountability, I mean if uh, a chief product officer is coming up and saying that, hey, we as a company, we need to focus on this space for the next three to five years, and we need to invest all our resources into this uh, space, then that person is accountable for that decision and the strategy. So if something goes wrong, then that person uh, is responsible for the outcome. And interpretability means uh, communicating to the stakeholders that I make this decision because of X, Y, and Z. So that anyone in the future or anyone who's, uh, who is not av uh, available in all the meetings can easily read a piece of doc or uh, a future hire can come and uh, read a piece of uh, internal wiki or something and then understand why a decision was made and what were the inputs and assumptions that were considered at that point in time, which led to that outcome. Now that's interpretability. Ethics is something which you are more responsible for the broader uh, community, uh, earth, sustainability, et cetera. So as a, as a leader, uh, everyone is required to be ethical in nature. So that again becomes a non-functional attribute. Um, again, the more higher you grow in the corporate ladder of a product manager, you need to demonstrate uh, leadership and uh, influencing the stakeholders in order to make the best decision for the customer for and for the product. So now these are the non-functional attributes of the product manager. Again, uh, I would like to iterate that the more you move from left to right, your your needle moves from clarity to ambiguity where you have, you're more clear on what you're working on on the left side of the spectrum and on the right side of the spectrum, you have no idea what you're going to be working on. And there's a lot of uh, data, quantitative and qualitative data that goes into uh, the decisions that you make as a senior product person. So that being said of a product manager's value proposition, now let's talk about the AI value proposition. Again, now it's the same map here of uh, someone who's from the junior PM to a product leader role. Um, you have the clarity to ambiguity spectrum here. Now, look, revisiting some of the common things that product managers do according to their role is more tactical in the as they are new or they are relatively in a junior position. And as they move to a, a higher position or a senior position, it's more ambiguous and more uh, strategic. So for example, an associate product manager gets to work with the design. They may work with the designers to come up with the UX. They write the different documents like product requirement documents or the market requirement documents. 
uh, the business requirement documents, etc. And the product manager, they start writing user stories. Um, they are expected to be aware of uh, agile methodologies like Scrum, etc. And then they are make they are expected to make uh, decisions based on the trade offs, etc. And a senior product manager strategy and a product leadership is more of problem discovery and vision, etc. So now, where does AI play a really good part? So if you look at the the left end of the spectrum, that's we have AI tools currently that do these things really well. That's why uh, that's what I call the current state of AI. Like we have AI tools to um, convert what you prompt to beautiful mocks. Um, AI can write documents for you, the first draft of the documents at least. AI can give you a project plan of what your process should be based on your company data. And uh, it can also help you come up with the first draft of um, your marketing blogs or uh, take notes for your customer research, et cetera. But the more right you go in this spectrum, which is where the leadership and uh, more ambiguity exists. Uh, it's an ambiguous area where AI uh, currently may not be able to perform as good as it does on the left end of the spectrum. And that's because there are a lot of uh, ways, there's no one correct answer for executing the right strategy. There are so many ways uh, people execute, people and companies execute strategy. So the way AI does cannot be like, you know, one right answer. And again, that comes to the interpretability where uh, if you were to ask a person to execute a strategy, you can understand what, what is their rationale and why they made the decision. Whereas if you feed a strategy into an AI model, you might not be able to understand or decipher why that model predicted the strategy because there are like so many millions of uh, nodes inside which is not practical for anyone to go and say it was it was because of this node within the model that made this decision. So AI lacks that kind of an interpretability and that's why the more ambiguous, the more senior uh, a decision is made, you need people making those decisions. That being said, what are some great examples of uh, how a product manager can leverage AI tools in today's world? Uh, a lot of product, product managers or almost every product manager has to uh, conduct user researches and or, or be or participate in user research and AI can generate great questions for your user research. Uh, you can automate note taking and insight generation for customer interviews where you just focus on talking to the customers. You can parse the user usage analytics to automatically group users into new cohorts. Uh, where you can find different new segments of users to uh, monetize and for growth hacking. And when it comes to observability and application performance monitoring, you can use AI to predict possible root causes for an event. Where and the next one is the stakeholder management. So a we currently can use AI to create a project plan based on the company org structure, ca capture project risks, assumptions, issues, and dependencies, and communicate to stakeholders by automating all these workflows. Uh, you can also use AI to create working prototypes for rapid experimentation, which is a very fundamental and crux of efficient product management. And for me personally, the thing I love the most when it comes to using AI to the best of our productivity is overcoming writer's blog by using AI tools to come up with the first draft for uh, with a framework of beautiful strategy doc or coming up with a, a great uh, blog or launch announcement or go to market emails. And once we have this first draft, now you no more no longer have this writer's block and then you are you have inspirations and then you can tweak it to whatever language or whatever however you want to con communicate the value proposition of the work that you're doing. Now moving on to the the third and final uh, section of this presentation is the product manager powered by AI value proposition. Now you may have seen a lot of these things posted all over LinkedIn and social media that AI is not going to replace you, but a person using AI is going to replace you. 
And uh, this is along the similar lines. And uh, I, I just want to try to uh, break down that line uh, to what actually means in product management co uh, context. <clears throat> now, recollecting the, the spectrum diagram once again, you see that these are the different skill set that a product person will need to do their job in their level of seniority. For example, an APM uh, will have to do wireframing, write docs, uh, might have to do system design, and so on and so forth. So this, the blocks that I've marked in orange, they can be done by AI today. There are a lot of great tools to convert your what you say into wireframes. Um, there are tools to generate text to write your pro product requirement documents, business requirement documents, and market requirement documents. There are AI tools to design what should uh, an efficient or what should a great API design doc should look like. What are the different parameters that an API design should uh, take consideration of, etc. Um, as as I said before, uh, AI can also help in user research, competitive intelligence, and coming up with defining metrics. The the next blocks, which are the green blocks, are which is are the blocks which we have AI today, but they are not that great in delivering those things. For example, insights. Um, you know, we still need a human person to, with the contextual institutional knowledge, to come up with that insight of why this metric is so. Um, the same goes to new product launch. You may have a lot of obstacles uh, when you're working towards a new product launch. So, as a person, you need to identify those blocks and resolve. Uh, those uh, conflicts that arise from a timeline perspective or from a dependency perspective. And this involves working with a lot of humans and communication and making sure that you address the needs of the stakeholders as and when they arise. Again, monetization, there's no one rule to do it, right? There are different strategies to do it uh, based on what your customers are willing to pay for, what are your competition is asking for, et cetera. So again, there's more of ambiguity in that. So there may be um, AI that does these things well to some, some extent, but still you cannot launch a product with a dollar value just based on AI. Now, the blocks in red are the ones where we need human beings to do those jobs. Like we are all, all the red block, blocks here identified are completely ambiguous in nature where you don't know what's out there you just have to go understand, empathize with the user, be creative in your solutions and see what works and what doesn't work and then take the company um, forward one step at a time. So for example, product discovery, there may be so many things what your customers might be doing. First of all, who is your customer? Who should be your customer? Who isn't your customer? AI cannot tell all these things, at least in today's world. So given given all that ambiguity, we need a human person who can be held accountable, who can understand why they are making the decision in that way, who can explain it to the to the stakeholders, who can influence the customers, who can influence the stakeholders, et cetera, to make the product successful. Again, a product leadership areas which consists of ethics, leadership, culture, those things need human uh to perform those areas in product management. Um, <clears throat> so what this means to um, the product managers and the companies. So the left end of the spectrum has a lower dollar value of impact in the organization where it's more executional and transactional. Whereas the more right you go in the spectrum, the dollar value of the organization uh, of the impact to the organization is really high. Like, a company, a CPO, a chief product officer identifying the next huge opportunity would be worth millions of dollars as compared to uh, a someone who is working on writing a product requirement document. So as you see, the dollar value of impact to the organization is gets higher and higher as you move, as you grow from junior positions to the senior positions in the company. And what this means to product managers, with the new AI wave that's coming in, product managers can grow to a senior position much faster than they could in the past. This means that they can use or leverage AI tools for doing their day-to-day -day jobs 
but at the same time spend effort and learn some of the human only uh, skills um, like i mentioned earlier like uh, working with uh, strategy and working getting comfortable with amb- ambiguity so that young product managers from early on in their career can focus that time in acquiring these um high dollar value skills and get to that position faster than ever so in short um the person who's the product manager who's using the ai will grow in their career much faster than a person who is not leveraging ai in their product management discipline thank you everyone i hope you enjoyed the webinar